have a panel discussion right in the morning on the digital future of education and skills because Kerala has a great ground to start with. So it is imperative that we model on the strong opportunities that we have in the sector, right? So we start off and uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to bring on stage our fabulous moderator who's been the resident editor of Financial Express in Bangalore and is currently the managing editor of Your Story, Mr. Darlington Hector, who's the moderator for the session. Welcome to the stage, sir. The first panelist joining him on stage is the partner for automation, central leader GDS of Ernst & Young. He has nearly 28 years of business experience in the professional services industry. He has previously served as a partner in Arthur Anderson till 2001. Pleasure to present to you Mr. Deepak Swaroop. Next up is a man who's the partner in PwC India's government and public services with an experience on working on and in delivering government smart city projects across the world. Pleasure to present to you, Mr. Sri Ram Anantashainam. Our next panelist has been in the forefront of virtual reality and its application to medicine design since 1993. And also very, very proud to announce here that he developed the world's first standalone VR-based robotic surgical simulator that is used across the world today. This is Mr. Tain Gurishi Keshavadas. I'd also like to add that he has co-founded two successful startup companies, so he's also a startup entrepreneur. Our next panelist is the managing partner and chief investment officer of Premji Invest, which is India's, one of India's largest family offices, and he is a chartered accountant by profession, presenting Mr. T.K. Kurian. He's also served as Wipro Limited's chief executive officer. Welcome, sir. Our next panelist is an internationally renowned scientist, technocrat, innovator, entrepreneur, and educationist. He is currently leading the research and development activities at Bioengineering Department at University of Utah in USA, presenting Mr. Ramachandran Tekedata. He has been the Vice Chancellor of our own Cochin University of Science and Technology, the man who went from here to US. And finally, joining us on stage is our own man, Mr. V.K. Matthews, the convener of Cash Future, and also the founder executive chairman of IBS Group. I hand it over to you, our moderator. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this panel. Today, we discuss in this morning a very relevant topic, the digital future of education and skills. As we know, education and learning are undergoing a great metamorphosis in this country and globally as well. We're going to discuss the future of education, the future of learning, and the future of teaching as well. The last thing that we want is that our children become just another brick in the wall. So towards this, we would like to open this discussion and most importantly, at the end of the discussion, have some key takeaways for the government as well. So today we have a very distinguished panel, the best possible people that we can have to discuss this and debate this topic. So we have Mr. Deepak Swaroop, who is a partner Automation Central Leader, ENY. We have Mr. Ramachandran Takedat, the former Vice Chancellor of Cochin University. We have Mr. Sriram Ananda Sainam, Partner, Government and Public Services, PwC. We have Mr. TK Kurian, Managing Partner and Chief Investment Officer, Premji Invest. Mr. Tenkurishi Kesavadas, Director, Healthcare, Healthcare Engineering Systems, University of Illinois and Mr. Mickey Matthews, who, who currently is representing the HPIC of the government of Kerala. I'm opening up this debate with, with a, some preliminary thoughts on this subject uh, from each of the six panel members. 
I would, I would want to start this off with Mr. Kesh. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Kesh, I mean, your, your preliminary thoughts on the subject, please. Thank you, Mr. Darlington. <coughs> uh, thank you for inviting me for this really nice event. And if you don't mind, I'll stand up and talk. I've been teaching for 20 years that um, I'm used to standing. Um, so it's a great pleasure coming back to Cochin. Uh, my father's family is from Ernaklum, and uh, every summer we would come back here on vacation. But I'm coming back here after 10 years, and I could say that, but for Google Maps, I couldn't find any other place today in this town. Um, in fact, this panel which we have today is a very good segue from yesterday's panels. Uh, if, if you were here yesterday, uh, you saw and heard about the challenges that the digital world is facing, starting from data sciences to transportation, hospitality industry, and healthcare. So one big question that might have come to your mind yesterday is that we know the challenges, but who's going to provide the manpower and the people who can run these machines of the future digital world? That really is a challenge which is confounding not just the universities, but schools and the government, and in fact, industries. Um, so we, as a panel, we are going to just think about what is going to happen uh, five or 10 years from now, and what we should be doing as a group to address this. So we know that data is very big. So who's going to do the data? We hear about automation, that many jobs are going to dis uh, disappear. Uh, so who's going to train the next generation of engineers who's, who are going to do artificial intelligence? Uh, who are going to be the next generation of blue-collar workers? It's a term which is very broadly used. But think of everything we heard yesterday about IoT sensors. Think of it. Five years from now, when you call a plumber, you're going to ask him to put an IoT sensor in a house. Okay, so your plumber the next generation is really going to be someone who would you would consider as an engineer today. Right? Who's going to fix the drones and who's going to fix all the battery operated cars? So there is this huge need. And we see that in the US, not just in India, we see this huge need for data scientists. And this is something I see from my university. So if you look at it, <clears throat> some of the biggest companies in the world, they are all located five miles away from some of the biggest universities in the world. Toyota set up its largest automated car research center next to Stanford. Facebook is located in Menlo Park, which is five miles away from Stanford. <clears throat> At University of Illinois, where I work, which is one of the biggest engineering colleges in the US, we have some of the biggest companies located right next to the campus. An example is Imbev, which is the largest beer company, which sells Budweiser. And every time someone opens a can of Budweiser, the data actually comes to our campus. And that's used as analysis to decide how we should be marketing. And guess who does it? Students. The reason they come and set up shop is because they want the student power to help in data science. So I say that this is equivalent to putting a hydroelectric turbine next to a waterfall. And the reason is universities and the colleges are the waterfall from where the next generation of engineers are created, and industry wants to tap them and steal them from the cradle. So that is something very interesting. The second thing is, what happens to the industry as it starts evolving? And that is, again, one of the things the panel will discuss. So we heard yesterday the chief technology officer from Lufthansa saying that their biggest worry is to make sure that their employees are employed as the transportation industry changes. So which means that people need to be ready to be trained, which means when we teach our next generation students, we are not teaching them a specific skill. We should be teaching them how to reinvent themselves as the world changes, right? Uh, we heard this quote yesterday that the illiterates of tomorrow are not the people who do not know how to read, but who have not learned how to learn, right? Uh, a very uh, famous uh, psychologist said that, uh, quite often bad, wrongly attributed to Alvin Toffler, but it's, it says that you should know how to learn. But how do we do that? Our systems are very structured, very modular. We don't really teach our students to prepare themselves for the next generation. Um, so which means that there are challenges uh, for the government. Uh, it's not just uh, for 
Kerala, it's also about India, and we face the same questions uh, in our university, which is, uh, as I was telling, one of the largest engineering colleges in the country. If you want to know how big it is, we have over 400 faculty members in the engineering college alone, and we train about 10,000 engineers. We meet industry every day. We meet people, companies like Imbev and Caterpillar and John Deere and State Farm uh, are located, and we ask them this question, how can we train them? So I will start by showing you just two slides of things we are doing in terms of innovation, okay? So can I have my first slide on screen, please? So one of the biggest innovations we have done is something called CS plus X. And I'll give you a little bit of history. Some of you might know that the digital revolution really started at our university. Uh, it is a home where in the 50s, a, uh, a transistor was invented. Uh, the first semiconductor lab was set up at our university in the 50s. And the first internet browser uh, Mosaic and later on Netscape was found by our students. And so was companies like YouTube and PayPal and Oracle and Siebel. Some of the best known companies which, uh, which led to the digital revolution started in the small campus two hours away from Chicago. So what we are doing today is something we call CS plus X. The idea here is that CS or computer science as a foundation of digital economy, it's not really a field by itself. And that is because everything from sound editing to agriculture needs computer science. So we have started now combining com computer science with all of these areas that's on the screen, anthropology, astronomy. We have just started crop sciences, agriculture. And now we are starting this year economics, advertising, animal sciences. So students these, from these programs come together, and they get a degree in computer science plus whatever they want to do. And the idea here is that the next generation of people who work in the digital industry should know the field, unlike what happens today where the software engineers go and then they try to find out what they're supposed to do. This is also true about healthcare. So that's my next slide. Is what we are doing in terms of education. So we are one of the leaders in virtual reality. And um, we have been using that to train uh, doctors and healthcare professionals uh, to come and uh, learn some very advanced skills using simulation. So let me see if I can get this to run, hopefully. OK, so what you see here is a glimpse of what we can do with a very low cost virtual reality system. So this is a skill called intubation, which is in fact done by doctors, nurses, and even people who are um, saving a person on the roadside after an accident. The process is shown in the left. You put a tube inside your trachea so that the patient can breathe. It happens millions of times a day. But learning the skill is very, very tough. It requires a lot of practice. So what you see in the bottom corner is a student who's learning how to do intubation. And on the left side, you see a software. And in that software, you can go inside and touch this virtual, virtual patient Look at videos of the process, and then in a completely immersive environment, which means you are inside this room, and you can watch the process of intubation. You can take and cut and look inside the patient like this is, he's going to do. He's a plane. He's cutting and looking at the inside the patient, so you can see the trachea, so you understand uh, the anatomy while you're doing intubation. Most of the time when you do intubation with a real patient, you don't see the inside, but we can do that. <clears throat> So you're watching and learning, you're fully immersed, and it's self-guided because of the fact that the student is, doesn't have a lecturer. Everything that this person is learning in intubation is being uh, learned step by step uh, through a bunch of real-time animation. And then you can practice yourself. And so that's what you're going to see next, is that the student has watched it and now going to look at various steps involved in doing that and is going to uh, learn how to put a tube inside, right? So we have an AI-based guidance system which can actually control your hand and tell you how the laryngoscope blade is put before the tube is put. So it is, in fact, better than learning it in a real world because in a real world, unless you have a lecturer or a faculty watching you, they cannot tell you if you're doing wrong. But in a virtual system, it will actually correct you if you don't do it correctly. And finally, assessment. 
It's very important education to know whether you have learned your skills or not. Very often, even doctors, when they learn and they go out, and it's true about every field, you are not sure what this person has really learned what is supposed to learn. But in these kind of environments, we can do that. So just an idea of what we can do with this technology in skill development and education. It's not just in medicine. This can also be used in engineering, in blue collar training. Uh, we have been trying to use that to teach people how to put uh, door pans on a car, for example, and so on and so forth. So here's a very exciting future. And I'm also looking forward to my fellow panelists to come and give their viewpoints and how education can be changed and improved for the future. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kesh. That was a wonderful uh, presentation from your end. Uh, TK, I would, I would like to, uh, you to actually take over and uh, give your thoughts on the subject, please. Thank you, Darlington. You know, one of the things I realized when I moved from selling technology to customers to being on the investing side was that I decided I wouldn't make any presentations. Because throughout my life, all I was doing was making presentations to customers. So now I only listen to presentations. But having said that, let me quickly take you through the world that we have come from and the world that we are going to. Because I think when you discuss a subject like education, education is a generational change. It is not a change where you can impact society over the next two to five years. It's not like government changes that we have in India. It's far more long-term. And hence, it's important to go back into the past to get a sense and also, again, relate back to the future to understand how society has dealt with this in the past and how it should prepare itself for the future. I'll also kind of give you a sense of uh, what's happened in terms of technology, what's happening in terms of technology as we go through this kind of cycle and how technology can fit in. So let me start with a very simple example. If you go back to the GDP of the world in 180, it was probably close to, these are estimates by the way, like every good economist, there are lots of numbers which will go around, but broadly this. The economy of the world was probably about 112 billion dollars, equivalent in today's currency. Today, it's about 127 billion. 1820 was a pivotal year when suddenly a lot of new technology came in. The first ginning machine came in. Spinning got automated. The first steam engine came in. And it started being deployed in terms, in terms of railways. Suddenly, what happened was a whole bunch of people who were involved with the manual spinning industry suddenly went out of business through mechanization. Suddenly what happened was people who used to take seven days to drive a car to land up with their goods could now send it by train. When you required three sets of people to do that, now you required probably an engine driver and somebody to kind of put coal into the steam engine. So the number of jobs that people were used to doing suddenly kind of came down substantially. From 1820, 1820, the, and it's a very pivotal year, the GDP of the world was 1.12 trillion. The GDP of the world today is 127 trillion. So if you look at it, it's been a flat growth from almost was 180 to 1820, and then 100 times growth after that in the next 200 years. And that primarily happened because of new technologies coming into the marketplace. So net-net, technology is not a threat. It's an asset. Just go back to what happened to society, and that's even more fascinating. Between 1820 and 1947, 180 million people lost their lives in war. And it's a very scary number. You had two big world wars, World War I and World War II. You had the French-Germanic War. You had the Chinese, you had the Boxer Revolution. 
you had two Chinese revolutions, and all across people died. You had the Indian mutiny. And if you go back and look at society, why did that happen? Because there were a large bunch of people who suddenly did not have jobs. And remember, that is the time when the movement had happened back from agriculture into industry, and now sitting in industry, they didn't have jobs. That's where the society began to put huge pressure on itself, and there was a massive impact in terms of people sitting down there not knowing what to do, politicians playing games to make sure that they, to keep the population quiet, nationalism was used as a tool, and a whole bunch of things happened. Funnily enough, what happened was, along with this, there was a huge focus on religion. Typically, what happens is, in countries where you have high economic activity, you will find religious activity to be low. If you go to China today, or even Japan, I mean, people who are brought up in a particular faith get married in a different faith, because they look good in photographs. But the whole concept of religion has completely gone away. But I think what's going to happen is, as we go forward, and today, if you look at it, as we, we are sitting right at the cusp of this revolution. We are sitting probably today in, not in 1820, but in 1827. Now, let me just go back, go forward 50 years and give you a sense of what the world will look like 50 years from now. All of you have heard this much bandied word of artificial intelligence, how machines are going to come and take over the world, and how, you know, very soon your companion will be a machine and not your wife. The reality is this, that any technology when it comes in, there is a dark side to it and it's a bright side to it. The bright side eventually wins. But yet, the societal impact of AI, the societal impact of medicine, and medicine itself, especially with DNA and RNA-based medicine, the whole genomic medicine, is completely kind of changing the way medicine is going to be practiced in the future. In fact, if any of you have time, go look up an interesting company called Moderna. Moderna is one of our investments, and fundamentally what we have done in Moderna is, Moderna is a company which is using RNA to get cells to heal themselves. You don't require chemicals to go into the bloodstream. So the kind of work that's happening at the, in the intersection of both artificial intelligence and medicine can affect everything that we do, starting with the food that we eat, which is what is uh, earlier called probiotic. Now what you, you do is use, use the microbiome to kind of make sure that people are able to solve disease states. Then you have RNA-based medicine, which is going to solve even most complex diseases like some forms of cancer. So the way medicine is going and the way you can use data to kind of transform the way we live, the opportunity is huge. But yet, there is going to be a massive societal impact for all of us who live today. The first and the biggest societal impact is going to be the haves and the have-nots are going to be very, very clearly differentiated. You can see that. In the old days, it used to be society was a hierarchy. You climbed a ladder, and the ladder at the top was the end of the ed end of the pyramid. Large part of people at the base of the pyramid looked for an opportunity to climb up the pyramid, land up at the top, make enough money, keep their kids happy, under the hope that the next society, their kids would live better than they did. That is a whole concept of making sure wealth was kept within society. Now, what's going to happen is that that structure is going to be broken. The middle level where people used to do white collar jobs, that job, that component is going to get sharply hollowed out. And yet, people who are sitting on the top are going to earn much more than people who sit in the middle and the bottom. Yet, we are not training for people at the bottom because we truly believe that a carpenter is not that relevant. And that's to a large extent society itself. A plumber is not that relevant. The reality is that those places are where you're going to find tremendous value as we go along, because life skills are never going to go away. The second big trend that's happening out there is look at the world around us. It's aging very quickly. 
Today, we have about 600 million people in the world who are above 65. Fast forward 2030, the number is going to be 1.3 billion. The population of the world is going to grow by something like 19%. The population that's above 65 is going to, is going to double. All these people are going to require help. Lifespans are kind of growing, going up. All these people are going to require skills to manage an aging population. That's going to be a huge opportunity as we go along. With these two in place, let's go back to our educational system. If you look at our educational system today, our educational system is purely based upon the old manufacturing method that is applied to education. So have you, or you folks must have all seen assembly lines, right? You start with the raw material, you land up at stage one, you do pass, fail, you throw away rejected items, stage two, pass, fail, rejected items, and then finally the end product comes out with a certain degree of quality. That's the same model the mass production model has been applied to education. Unfortunately, what's happened is a degree by itself is not going to mean anything as you go forward. The biggest three skills that you require going forward are creativity, learnability, and critical thinking. And all those three we don't train today in schools and in our colleges. Now, I'm not suggesting that we have a revolution here and we change the entire educational system. But where all this comes together, where your curriculum and your student comes together, the missing link here is the teacher. And that is one area where for some strange reason, we don't seem to be putting enough focus. Governments believe that having more teachers is better. The reality is that today in India, in some states, the teacher-student ratio is running at eight students to a teacher, which means that in some schools, you're forced to have teachers. So like one of my panelists was telling me, a social education teacher is now teaching mathematics. And that's the fundamental issue. So to a large extent, I think that's the link that we need to solve. And more importantly, we need to solve it with technology. Today, technology exists where you can actually make the brain, train the brain to learn faster. And what I would seriously urge here, right here, as far as the government is concerned is, go back, let's go back to basics, let's look at the one link that we have, which is the teacher, and work on that. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, TK. Um, very valid points, and um, I mean, especially on those life skills, um, in the fact that, uh, we in India typically want to run down certain um, job profiles and hold some other in high esteem. Um, and the great point about creativity too, I mean, I probably that's one area we, we probably need to scale up. Um, so I turn my attention to Mr. Um, Deepak Sarup, um, and um, uh, it would be great to have your uh, points of view taking off from what uh, TK was talking about. Thank you. Darlington. So can I have my slide up, please? While they're bringing that up, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Uh, I lead automation in Ernst & Young. So we are automating our own business. And so some of the points that have already been made and I'm sure will be made are the issues and challenges and opportunities we are facing today in EY. So I'm going to start by just highlighting what the problem is based on some data points. And I'm sure you've heard a lot of data uh, you know, yesterday and a number of panels and, and speeches. But it would be good to contextualize this, as well as what the opportunity is for us going forward. So what we see here is, um, um, so this data was actually pulled together by EY in the last few months. So it's a fairly recent set of uh, data points. What you see here is a knowledge deficit which exists and will only grow. So what we know today in terms of technology uh, knowledge is actually going to go away, 50% of that is going to go away in a couple of years. What that means is that our education system, whatever it might be, it's going to have a huge uh, challenge in front of us. 
The second point here is, of course, talked about extensively. Large number of jobs are going to either change or going to get replaced. And, and that is uh, a current and ongoing theme that we are seeing in many of the uh, discussions. The third one on the top right is very interesting. We heard from Mr. V.K. Matthews' presentation yesterday that number of jobs are actually declining in many of the countries. But what is also interesting is that the GDP is growing. So how is that working out? And that's a very interesting data to be looking at. The third one is the trends that we are observing. We all have seen what's happening in the US. It's politics driven. I live in London. Brexit has been a huge uh, issue for us. It's been talked about globally. And closer to home here, we are seeing a reverse uh, globalization in terms of the number of jobs in the Middle East. These trends are here to stay, whether they are because of political reasons or other reasons. Finally, the complexity of technology is changing. Now, this is a big topic for this conference. Automation is here to stay. It is not going away, and it is a good thing, as Mr. Korean was saying earlier. History has shown that whenever automation has come, it has actually delivered even more jobs, but potentially in the longer term, not in the immediate term. So there is an immediate challenge, but let's not get despondent about it. At EY, we are embracing automation. We have one of the largest uh, uh, number of bots, which we call as digital workforce for ourselves. And that is actually liked by our people, because people don't like to do repetitive work. They don't like to do time-consuming uh, mundane activities. They don't like to look through huge amounts of data, detect trends. That's what automation allows us to do. So we feel automation is definitely here to stay, and it's going to transform the way we are working going forward. So let's just move on to what is The opportunity is huge. So while all that is happening for India, let's keep some of these data points in mind. Our middle class is going to grow dramatic, is growing dramatically, and continue to grow. Our millennials are going to show what those new roles and jobs are going to look like based on their preferences, how they want to buy goods, how they want to inter interface with the public services. And that's going to create a whole new set of roles and jobs in the future. What's also interesting, as I lead the automation effort in EY at a global level, is the large IT uh, population and in India. It is one of the largest, and I'll say one of the most versatile populations. We are able to transform and train this population a lot faster that I'm finding in other parts of the world. In fact, in Kerala, we have 5,000 people, and we started our automation journey from Trivandrum, one of our flagship wave, wave space um, uh, concept, which is really showcasing latest technologies, is in Trivandrum, and it's across 20 other cities in the world. So we can do things if we are really committed to do that. I would only end by one sort of um, uh, point, which is if we as industry and the education um, uh, fraternity and the academia, as well as the government come together, we, and we need to have more forums and dis uh, uh, points of contact, I think we can make a huge difference today and of course, there is a longer term aspect of how we influence the schooling and teaching in our schools. So that would be my opening call. Yeah. Thanks, Deepak. Um, thank you so much. Um, just talking about automation, uh, just, uh, my thoughts go back to, uh, since we are holding this seminar and uh, conference in um, Kerala, um, I think when the advent of, during the advent of computers and computers were making its uh, way into society, 
I think um, uh, Kerala was one state which had reservations about it. I think, um, um, and uh, today, uh, you know, we are holding a conference in uh, Kerala where we are talking about uh, the future of digital and so on. And and just just like what you mentioned about automation, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm also pretty uh, confident and optimistic that. Um, um, Automation would probably look like taking away jobs at this point, but, but as we roll out into the future, it's going to result in a whole lot more jobs. Um, so I'll just invite uh, Mr. Sridham into the conversation um, to take off from Deepak's uh, viewpoints. Sure, thank you. And uh, good morning, everybody. It's an honor and pleasure to be here talking to such an august audience in terms of uh, the future of education and skilling. Uh, you know, a lot of people talked about uh, how the supply is being managed. I want to spend a bit of time in terms of how the people who are consuming that supply really know what they're getting. Uh, because like Kesh said, uh, disciplines are changing from computer science to computer science plus X. There is a lot more of knowledge that a person is developing, so you're no longer buying a, uh, hiring a computer scientist. You're hiring a computer scientist with some skills, capabilities, knowledge in something else. TK talked about the manufacturing aspect of uh, uh, education where at the end of it, um, you know, we get uh, a student with a certificate coming out of it. So uh, a recruiter probably is not uh, hiring somebody with just a certificate, but a recruiter is, somebody, is hiring somebody who's got a lot more knowledge, skills, and capabilities than that particular certificate coming in. And uh, Deepak did talk about how do you reskill the workforce as, as we go by? Now, in the current day and time, when, um, when somebody is looking for hiring a particular person, we look at these aspects. Now, now we are also trying to understand what that person's soft skills and capabilities are all about by looking at a social media presence and other details as well. But now, what do we know about that particular person? What do we know about that person's skills? other than what is being shown in his credentials, uh, other than what the person brings in his folder when he comes for a work interview, or what a headhunter does uh, research about that person on LinkedIn or, or other aspects. So what exactly do we need? We should ideally have a 360 degree view of a professional, which is based on his education, it's based on his skill, it's based on his professional experience, but what are we now looking at? We are looking at certificates. Currently, certificates is not equal to knowledge. There is much more out there in the market, which is all about your uh, badges and online learning programs and MOOCs. Knowledge itself is just not sufficient. We are looking for people who are competent in certain specific aspects, like TK said, in terms of somebody who's got life skills and other aspects. So it's about apprenticeships, internships that a person has done, the work experience that he brings to the table. Now, competence alone does not mean success. Uh, we need a lot of soft skills. Look at the EQ that a person brings to the table. What is the leadership acumen? Some of the creativity, learnability, critical thinking that TK alluded. So how do we capture all of this uh, for a particular person while we make that particular person uh, employable and we hire him into a particular uh, job? Now, this is a question for which uh, currently uh, there are no answers. Uh, but uh, going forward, there are certain technological breakthroughs uh, beyond the AIs and, and ARs uh, uh, that the panelists talked about, which can potentially enable this. Now, how do we track and measure lifelong skill development? That's a question that I'm trying to answer here. Because this is very important. On the supply side, if we do everything that is needed, unless the demand side is able to consume the supply side with a level of certainty, with a level of confidence and with a level of trust. Uh, unless we bridge this supply-demand gap, the whole aspect of skilling, learning, lifelong learning would not be of much use. That's the hypothesis I'm, I'm driving here. Now, what we need is a candidate's reputation. Reputation in terms of skills, in terms of knowledge, in terms of softer aspects, everything captured in a particular manner. Currently, a technology called blockchain um, can power such a system. Uh, this is still in its nascency, and a lot of uh, research work is happening in this particular area. Uh, some of the uh, leading companies in the world, like Sony, uh, with part of, uh, as part of Sony Global Education, is trying to bring this uh, uh, into reality. 
Now, what does it mean? So a person through his life consumes knowledge, he acquires knowledge, he produces some knowledge for his uh, own team and for his people, and he transfers this knowledge over a period of time. How do we capture all of this particular information in a way that it can be attributed to that particular person? This attribution of knowledge, skills, experience, on-the-job trainings, mentoring, coaching, all of that has to be captured to enable a 360-degree view of a particular person. Now, blockchain as a technology can power uh, such a scenario and uh, in a way that you can provide lifelong history about a particular person's uh, skills, capabilities. It becomes event-driven uh, and it's open and consent-based. The last one is very important. Unless I, as a candidate, does not want to tell my potential future employers about certain skills that I have, my future employers may or may not have that particular information. This is a cutting edge um, uh, area, probably a once in a generation opportunity. So in line with what uh, uh, Darlington said in the beginning, I would really request and urge uh, uh, Kerala and the government of Kerala to see how we can take a lead in this particular aspect to build such a reputation management system for our students, assuming all the supply side issues are taken care of, and that can be an exemplar and a leading light for the country and for the world itself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sridharam. Um, we now move on to Mr. Matthews. Um, uh, Mr. Matthews, I've been, Kerala has always been the forefront of education in the country. Um, I would love to have your perspective on, um, while, while also having your opening remarks on the subject, uh, also would like to know from you whether Kerala can lead the digital future um, of education as well. Um, so over to you. Thank you, Darlington. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, very interesting uh, initial thoughts. I'll try to bring in a little bit of perspective from the, we are talking about future of skills and future of education and what is really changing and what is making that new future. If I really look at the world and divide that into, and, and divide that into the supply side and the demand side, and what digital technologies are increasingly able to do is to connect the individual producers with the individual consumers. Now, every producer would like to move and take his products and services directly to the consumer. That means if I, I come from the travel transportation side, every travel producer, like any airline producing a seat or a hospitality company having a room or a tour operating company having a cruise or a tour, they all would like to take their products and services directly to the consumer bypassing all the non-value adding intermediaries. This is a major trend and this happens and will happen not only in travel, in every place, yeah? That's one. And what that shift would then mean in terms of the skills that would be required in future. The second thing is we want to amplify the consumption behavior of the consumers for us to sustainably grow, which means that I would like to personalize what I am offering rather than you know, bombarding our customers with what we have. Sell what they need rather than what you have. Personalize. So personalization is an important aspect. And what are the skills that would be required in that kind of a situation? And the third point is, like what Amazon does, all of the big players like Google does, we would like to, every player would like to offer everything that the customer needs, not just what they produce or not just what they operate, which is called virtualization or convergence. So disintermediation, personalization, and virtualization are the possibilities in the digital era when you are actually connecting. Now, what are the things, what are the kind of capabilities or the skills required to operate in that kind of a paradigm is something that we should be really thinking about. Before going to that, I'll come to that and in the Kerala context. Before that, I'll also say what we see as the major, major changes that will be taken, you know, where we will lose jobs, 
where we will create jobs. In fact, it's very interesting. There are three distinct areas we can see us losing jobs in our journey from now until 2030 based on a very detailed research conducted in Germany. Physical, predictable jobs at the lowest end of the pyramid, maximum job loss. Second one, data collection. That means all of the so-called white collar jobs, maximum loss of hours. Third, data processing. These three put together will in a way have 90% of all of the jobs that get shifted or displaced. And where are we going to have the corresponding jobs getting created? There are three other areas, in fact, four other areas that gets. And the number one, the number one, and this is where education has to point to, is application of expertise. We have to educate, competence would get redefined as your ability to apply knowledge, apply expertise. Maximum jobs, net job addition. The second one, in the, the, the biggest one is, that is managing and developing people. Managing and developing people will be another area where maximum jobs will get ad added. And interaction with stakeholders. The stakeholders in different verticals are different. Managing the stakeholders, another major area that will, their jobs get added. And jobs will also get added as we walk more and more side by side with machines. We will also have actually non-predictable physical. For example, old age, the world is graying and aging. And when we have more and more old people and, and less and less actual people working, we would need non-predictable physical work required in many areas. This, these are the, the kind of shifts that I can actually see. And if I really look at the first three trends, disintermediation, personalization, and virtualization. And what are the kind of skills that you would require? Let's take personalization. The skills required there is, I would like to know my customer, or I would like to know to whom I am, I am pro providing the service, be it health services, be it commercial merchandise. I should know my customer. And how will I know my customer? All of the data that I can collect from enormous touch points of a customer, whether it in the hospital, whether it in the, at the airport or onboard flight or in his you know, a, a supermarket, I need to be able to process that data. That means data scientists and data sciences is important. And data is of no use if you don't have the power to actually make information which then can lead to taking some actions. So therefore we need artificial intelligence. And again, we would want to have machines to increasingly learn. So AI programming, AML programming, data science is very important. And it's again extremely important, ladies and gentlemen, with th millions of people writing applications which you can use in your handheld devices, it will be humanly impossible for us to cope with all of that happening. So in future, all of us will have just one application. That's my application. And that application should be able to interact with every other application. And so therefore, it's extremely, extremely important that people are able to have that kind of standards developed so that it, you know, on the one side, we are breaking standards. On the other side, there is an increasing need for standards. So I'll stop the, here as the, the opening comments. And before I come to the Kerala and Kerala opportunities, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Um, uh, I, I just turn over to the, our um, professor, Mr. Ramachandran um, uh, for your for your um, opening remarks. I'm very ha happy to be back in India and to my own coaching. Thank you for inviting me to this place, this conference. <clears throat> you heard my co-panelists have a big, large wish list. And uh, probably I have the interface to implement those things 
and uh, becoming an effective interface between the ground zero and uh, the government and the society at large. So I, <coughs> I'll, I'll confine my discourse on the two questions. How do we prepare workers and students for the 21st century jobs? How can the policy makers and academic institutions be part of the process? So there are a lot of other questions to be answered, but this is my mandate in this panel. It's simple. It's very ground zero. Everybody can understand that. The ultimate objective of education is, I would say, is the overall development of a student, knowledge acquisition, personality development, social and career, and personal skills. Ultimately, we want to transform a raw kid. I'm not suggesting a raw material as such. A raw kid into a useful, perfect citizen. That's the purpose of education system. And of course, it needs to be, you have to think this is not a real raw, raw product or a commodity. It's a human being with blood, breathing, emotions, everything together into a body, a human being. So you have to consider all these discussions thinking that this is not a commodity. And I'll base my, all my arguments on this. We have a responsibility to the government and the society at large. We need to make sure that no child is left behind. Everybody is brought up in this uh, endeavor. And our own system is not amenable to fast changes, as uh, Mr. Kurian has uh, mentioned. It takes a lot of time to change. We cannot experiment with students because it's, they are human beings. They have parents, they have grandparents, they, are, they have aspirations, emotions. So we have to work. When, when we design something, we have to think all these aspects. But all these students, we need to ensure that they have a job after all those four or six years of study at the college level. And for that, we need to have a flourishing, profitable industry to run wherever it is. So almost always, the four years I was here, I always listen hear about the employability aspects of our graduates. They don't have enough soft skills. They don't have enough core competency. So what, what can we do on these aspects? Probably, I would say, with my experience four years here, uh, we need to have strict quality control on all the aspects of education, teaching, exam, evaluation. So there are a lot of problems in when you actually implement these aspects in a college or university environment. Uh, and teachers are the assets of the whole system. They are the crucial point in this whole aspect. And teachers are the problem. As the vice chancellor, I know sometimes the teachers are the problem. She's uh, our higher, higher education secretary is smiling. So, uh, so we need to incentivize teachers to improve change according to the situation. How this can be implemented? I have some suggestions, but we need to discuss. Of course, online courses are, I would say, at this point of time, it is only a supplement. 
it cannot be the thing. Online courses, MOOCs, and all those things are only supplements. Uh, one of my friends in University of Utah, who was doing, actually directing, leading the MOOC program there, he said, okay, this is for other kids, my own kid, he needs to go to the university or college. This is half joking, okay? One of the important things I found from my experience in the US, my kids st studied their whole career was in the US. They, have a, they had a choice to change their subject after joining the, because they want to be a mechanical engineer, but uh, after one or two years, they find out that that's not their choice that it's not matching their expectations. So they want to change. That possibility is available in US or Europe, I would, I would assume. But we don't have that here. We don't have enough resources to make it happen here. So, and that's why probably I, my experience at Cochin University is, that's the, one of the main reasons we cannot change, or one student, if he wants to change from mechanical engineering to electrical engineering, there's no choice. There's no way you can implement at this point of time. So at the governmental level, time, time, okay. I need to fast forward a little bit. Sure. Um. I think uh, I think we'll close the opening remarks here. I'll just quickly go through a second round of questions. Maybe we okay. can, um, you know, delve, maybe come back on some of those points during okay. as course of that. Okay. Um, uh, TK, I just uh, want to ask you a question. Maybe the, the rest of the panel members can all come jump on that as well. Um, <clears throat> now, how do we prepare for the future of jobs? I mean, you know, right? I mean, do we prepare for a job? Do we prepare for a career? Uh, do we prepare for education, right? I mean, right now, uh, it's not very clear as to what to focus on, right? I mean, w w I mean, from your point of view, what is it that uh, students of tomorrow need to concentrate on? I, I think, you know, really, and this is a personal point of view, I think we have to prepare for a life. Okay. I think that's the most important part of it. Right. And some way, we kind of forget that. Because, you know, if you look at education today, the human brain works through a concept which is called plasticity. Plasticity of the brain. Plasticity of the brain is really about figuring out how quickly you can change based upon external stimuli. So the more external stimuli we are able to give the brain, the better it is prepared to kind of react to it. Right. Right. And I think the human mind is a very interesting, uh, you know, it's a very interesting kind of an organ. Think about it. You know, this is such low volume, but such terrific processing power. And the reason behind that is the human brain is the only brain among the mammals that really uses what is called as top-down thinking. Typically what happens is an animal reacts to stimuli. Uh, it chases food, it reacts from, it runs away from threat. The human brain is able to put in a thought into it, an objective. And based upon the objective, it's able to model action. And that is the biggest difference between a human brain and an animal brain. And I think we need to kind of harness the power of the human brain to basically make lives better. And I think that's a very important part of what we do. It's not getting a degree which is the end. It is what you what the degree, do with the degree for the next, up to the time you're 90, which hopefully, you know, by the time medicine kind of progresses, we'll all be 90 to 100. But that is the kind of time frame we need to kind of live with. Right, thanks, TK. Anybody else would want to actually add to what TK's uh, views on that? I think you asked a question, is it about a job, is it about a career? And I think it's about both, but in different contexts. Okay. I think for jobs, again, it's a current jobs and future jobs. And I would say there's a deficit for current jobs that we have. If you want to automate, if you want to adopt, embrace the new technologies. Okay. 
So very important to do that. But from a career point of view, I think it's more important that people look at the career very differently in the future. Mm -hmm. It is not the lifelong, stable job, you know, quarter century type of uh, uh, careers. It is going to be more online. You need to think about, you know, every year, two years, what are you doing? Okay. And do you need to move on? Okay. Mr. Matthews? Um, it's a very important question. What, what is the true purpose of the future of education? What's the true purpose? I think if you look at a country like India, and if you look at a country, a state like Kerala, I think we have to be very clear to make sure that we can economically secure the future of our people at this point in time when we are probably in a scale of one to 10, somewhere between four to five, or maybe at best. I think future of education or manpower plan, so when you do the education planning, we definitely must do the manpower requirement planning. It's very important. In my view, the future of education for Kerala, of course, cannot be just for education, but it should be to, to, to equip people to be able to have a job and through that a career as well. So I think we really should give 90% of importance to that. Acquiring knowledge for the heck of knowledge is an important aspect because only when you have knowledge you would know how you will be able to apply. So it's like a window shopping. So it's quite important that we give importance to what are the kind of jobs that are going to be there in future and fine tune our education at least tactically. Right. Uh, we, we also have a few questions coming up through um, the Kaizala app uh, some from the audience. Um, um, I, I would like to rephrase some of those questions and ask um, as well. Uh, there's this question around what will the future of schools and universities be, um, especially in the context of learning applications like Baiju's and so on. Um, so uh, so I, I would like to kind of rephrase that question maybe. Um, is, is it important to be now formally educated? I mean, do, is it now, I mean, like, like, um, like we all did in the past, is it, are formal is, is our formal degrees uh, going to be uh, very important in the future? Uh, because today you can, you can learn anything online with, with applicants to the Coursera and Baiju's and stuff like that. So the question is around that. What will the future of schools and universities be in this context? Who would like to answer that? So I think uh, we have to split this question into two. There are certain things that would need application-based learning. It could be somebody training to be a doctor or somebody training to be a plumber or a carpenter. So there is only so much that one can learn through um, uh, you know, online or other applications. But there are other professions where it's a service oriented professions where you can learn a lot through online, but with some kind of uh, intervention. So my personal view on this in terms of how the future is going to uh, pan out is uh, over a period of time, the avenues for people to pick up knowledge on the latter area is going to explode significantly. When that explosion happens, there has to be a mechanism by which it can be captured against a particular person and potential employers can use that. Now, if that happens, then maybe our current formal education system for service-oriented industries would see a decline, probably. But on the former, where there is real hands-on application, I'm not sure how, you know, while we learn the uh, intubation, a person would need to apply it on a patient to be really successful at the emergency room. So those kind of jobs would need some kind of formal education after we have gone through some basic education. So you ideally split into two and then address it that way. Okay, okay sure, would you like to add to that? Uh, I think that um, uh, it's important to look at the whole experience of learning. Um, like I said in my initial talk that um, college and schools are very limited in what you can provide. You know. Um, I'm sure some of the industry people maybe you know better, but what I've heard often is most people who go into the workforce, they're not really prepared to work in a workforce. It requires further training and things like that. And this is also true for people who look for new jobs. So combining the life experience, uh, like say cryptocurrencies, how many universities and colleges actually teach cryptocurrency? But if you want to find a job in that field, you've got to learn it yourself and prove to someone that you'll learn. So, I think that the future kind of jobs would require a combination of learning things outside with some foundation that we, we can provide from a university. 
the uh, the other question that has come in probably what um, what I f feel significant is but what is the role that AI can play uh, with regard to um, development of teachers, right? I mean, a teacher sometimes is the most uh, neglected element sometimes um, uh, in this context. So, Deepak, any views on what roles that AI can play in development of teachers? It's a very interesting question. I think AI is, uh, the foundation of AI is based on really data. And unless you have really good data, your ability to generate intelligence out of it is, is limited. But having said that, I think there are a lot of tools that are being developed. We saw the uh, use of AR in medical education. And uh, similarly, there are many other areas where uh, augmented reality or what is now being called as mixed reality can be leveraged for education. So I think AI clearly has a role to play, but it needs to be more driven by what tools and applications come through on the basis of the data that, that, is, that exists or is going to be captured in the coming days. Um, I, think, I think we should now um, try to look to wrap up the session, but not before we have uh, the final remarks. I would like each of the members here, panelists here, to um, maybe mention a couple of takeaways that um, that is possibly actionable. Um, and I think a state government in this particular context has a big role to play. And I think the Kerala government, who's uh, proactive in many of the things, especially related to subjects related to education and health care, I'm sure they would listen to this and um, um, hope take, uh, and hopefully take some action on these. Um, so I, I, would I would love to have each of your viewpoints uh, in terms of takeaways. So I would start with. Um, Mr. Ramachandran, I mean, what could be a couple of those takeaways that we should leave behind from this panel discussion? Yeah, we need, uh, we need to update uh, the teacher because uh, the requirement of the uh, industry is drastically changing. So I would suggest uh, two teacher streams. One is a permanent core competency and the second one is where the teacher upgrades himself, herself, every five years. Second one is the two streams of teacher uh, programs. The second one is the industry provides one month salary for a recruit, recruiter. Why don't they provide one month salary to the college? Because we need finance. College needs finance, and we are incentivized to provide you the type of students, the, the type of uh, people you want, if you provide, pump back some money to us. So that's my Thank you, suggestion. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, TK, uh, your takeaways, I mean, uh, it would be great if we can actually have two actionable points that the state government can actually take forward. I mean, look, take forward. So the, I think the biggest thing that if you look at education in our country, and this is right across, this is a this is politicized to an extent where it probably should not have, should not be. Because think about it. Education is where you make impact over the next 30 to 50 years. And to that extent, policies have to remain consistent. So my first plea to the government would be, create a consistent set of policies that irrespective of the political parties that come in, they stick to it, and they, as a consensus, they agree to it. And that's a very, it's very, very important. <laughs> I never thought I'd get this response. <laughs> the second part, which I think is very important, is going back to the earlier point, focus on the teacher. The teacher is the link between the student and learning. The teacher can make the subject exciting. The teacher can make it boring. What you end up doing with the subject and the interest that it creates in you will create a, uh, create a human being which can kind of learn on an ongoing basis. If the teacher doesn't learn, the student is never going to learn. So to that extent, today there are enough technology tools which are available to do this. One is simple things like teacher education, more online courses. There are even tools available today that can help the mind learn faster. So if any of you have any interest, go look at a tool online. Go look at a company called Akili. This trains people 
who have got PTSD, who have come back from Afghanistan or Iraq to overcome PTSD. The same tool can be used for learn teaching. So there are a whole bunch of things that you can use in this area to kind of accelerate teaching in people who don't have the ability to kind of change. So use technology. I think that's the net of it. Thank you. Okay, show it to you. Thanks. So um, I, went, I did my degree here almost 25, 30 years back. And one thing I learned over the last 25 years is that our system that we follow here in, in India that's purely based on marks actually creates a big problem in how we educate our students. Uh, in US, you do get uh, credits for things you do outside your uh, school, so you encourage creativity. But if you look here, the entire focus of a high school student is to score very high marks, either in an entrance exam or in your school, so you get into college. And this, uh, this thing uh, continues. I'm not sure how this can be converted into a policy for the government, but I think it's high time uh, if Kerala wants to be a leader uh, in education to see how we can give credit for the things that is done outside your school and classwork so students can start thinking out, outside their day-to-day -day and, 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 uh, and uh, be uh, more ready for the kind of uh, areas they want to have a profession. And so I think this is something the government needs to look at. It's not just uh, in engineering, but everything, and allow the experience uh, to be uh, more holistic in all process, getting into college, admissions, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, thanks, Kesh. Uh, Deepak, your takeaways? Yes, I, I would um, say one thing, if we can do and I think in Kerala, some of it is already happening, but if we can enhance that, which is creation of joint venture between the government, the industry, and academia. And I think the three of them have a lot to bring to the table. Industry itself, while it talks about artificial intelligence, it talks about a whole range of things, all of that knowledge is sitting in academia. Academia would, would really um, do well to understand how it can be applied in industry. The government has a huge role in incentivizing, uh, potentially even funding, these kind of joint ventures. So I would say we, we need to step up substantially the interaction between the three pillars. Yeah. Shridham? So my statement is coming from a lot of anguish in terms of a lot of educational institutions that have sprung up, that have got sunset. They're not able to keep up pace with the cyclical nature of the industry that currently is. So my recommendation would be two, to manage uh, the supply demand gap. First, in terms of uh, the academia knowing really what the future demand is going to be. What role can the government play by bringing the academia and the industry together and look at some kind of long-term planning for skills and start embedding that right from the professional education or the basic science and arts education? That is one aspect. Now, assuming that is done, I would then go back to what I presented earlier in terms of a reputation management system for a particular student on what are the lifelong skills that he has attained so that when the demand is there, the, the education institutes are prepared to provide that particular demand and there is trust and uh, uh, ability uh, for the job recruiters to hire the right set of people based on the lifelong skills and competencies that a student or a professional has built. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Matthews, I mean, um, Mr. Matthews, yeah. with you, I'm not restricting you to two uh, recommendations because you, you understand the system so well in Kerala. So um, please feel free to kind of come up with any number of recommendations that you would like to say government to yeah. take up, um, and that'll be great. Thank you, Darlington. Yeah, um, I th think one takeaway, which is important for the state government, for the Kerala government, uh, which I'll also work with the department, um, is we should, going forward, let's not create educational policies. Uh, I think we should create a digital education strategy for the state, which should have at least three elements. That strategy should have two or three elements, which summarizes what 
the distinguished panelists said, the first one of that should be a digitally enabled student and teacher fraternity. That means our campuses, our colleges, our universities should be digitally enabled. We are way behind. Maybe we are slightly better than the, the nation and on an average, but we are still way behind. I was actually in, in one workshop last week where a university vice chancellors participated as well. So that's one. The second part of that, second part of that strategy, that is a digital education strategy. The second element of that strategy could be that more academic autonomy is provided to universities because whilst we need to have the standards and whilst there are risks associated with that, it is extremely important that we allow our universities to re react and respond, commensurate to the changes that's actually taking place. And the third one, one underlying principle, if, if all of us talked about continuous learning has to be a way of life for us to survive. Now, how do we create that kind of a, a mindset in the minds of the educators and the students? In my view, the third point, therefore, we have to bring in, it's a loaded statement, the purpose of schooling for us cannot be for testing anymore, it has to be for learning. The purpose of schooling has to be learning and not for testing. It's a loaded statement, we have to see what does it mean. So, again, I'm repeating, digital educational strategy with key pillars being digitally enabled studies, students and teachers. Artificial intelligence, many things will come. The second I'm repeating, academic autonomy for colleges. There are risks we did discuss, but I think we, even if we get it only 30%, we will be pretty okay. And we will have a policy and with a lot of other elements underneath, the purpose of education, purpose of schooling has to be for learning and not for testing as it is today. So this is how I would make the recommendation. That's a great set of recommendations, I think, from all the panelists. I think uh, the state government would take a note of this, and um, I'm hopeful that they take this uh, seriously and action some of these points. Uh, it's been a wonderful panel. Um, it's a very worthwhile um, uh, discussion. Um, uh, a great uh, round of applause for the panelists, please. Thank you. As they said, academia is indeed the best link, or bridge rather, between our industry and human capital. And if we get education right, we get most part of the future right. Thank you so much for all these experts on our stage. And I'd like to invite Mr. V.K. Matthews, a host of the event, to present our mementos to the rest of the panelists, starting with Mr. Deepak Swaru. I request you gentlemen to take the center stage while you present and receive the memento. Mr. Deepak Shuru, Mr. Ramachandran Takedatta, Mr. Sri Ram Anantashayanam, Mr. Darlington Hector. And gentlemen, before you leave the stage, I request all of you to please step up and pose for a picture. 